The college player draft for the 100th season of the NFL begins tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern. In 1935, Burt Bell used an idea that was first expressed in Thomas Reed's essays on the intellectual powers of man in the 1780s. In his essay, Thomas described that in every chain of reasoning, the evidence of the last conclusion can be no greater than that of the weakest link of the chain, whatever may be the strength of the rest. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is February 8th, 1936, and we are at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You see, nowadays, though, 2019, we'd be celebrating the Super Bowl champion. We'd be possibly watching them at the parade. Unfortunately, it seems like a lot of times that's over in New England. But then again, that's kind of the point of the reason for this episode. You see, this didn't happen not back in 1936. February, there was something else going on. And this is the day where the owners would embark on a new journey that would change the landscape of the NFL forever. But what event could that have been? Was it a new championship game? Was it the All-Star game? No. Was it a new team coming into the league? Something with some new pizzazz and gusto? It was not. It was something else. And this event started back on May 18th, 1935 at the Fort Pitt Hotel in Pittsburgh. You see, there were eight owners and Joe Carr. There were nine owners in the league at the time. There were nine teams, and unfortunately, the Cardinals owner at the time was not there because he was sick. But we're sitting here with nine gentlemen. We have eight owners and the president at the time, Joe Carr, sitting at the Fort Pitt Hotel in Pittsburgh for an owner's meeting. And then this crazy cat individual guy, he stands up. His name is Burt Bell. He decided that he was going to propose something that at the time maybe could have been thought as ludicrous. He said that we need to change the NFL forever. And by golly, it did. He suggested something that you and I now take for granted. Burt Bell, the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles, and then future owner of the Steelers and the first great commissioner, would propose the first selection of college prospects, which they called back the time, it was the selection of players. But we now call it the NFL Draft. The great equalizer and spreading of talent. Now, why did he do this, though? I mean, there's probably a couple of reasons, many reasons for that matter. First and foremost, his Eagles, uh, they were not so good for a while. They were normally at the bottom of the barrel. Hard to get more players coming to your team when you just keep losing. Not to mention that we've talked about in other episodes covering Burt Bell that they were losing a lot of money, too. And this is during the Depression. So we are just not having a good time here. But also, more for the league, this is important because he said it would create a competitive balance which would be best for the league and all the owners to combine. So, Bell proposed the NFL is only as strong as its weakest link. and He was, for a long time, the weakest link, so he should know. And this is where I say that Bell used the same concept as Thomas Reed's essays back from the 1780s because he said, it doesn't matter how strong the rest are, it only matters the strength of your weakest link. And again, he should know, because he was at the bottom for quite some time. But those teams that were not at the bottom, we've got the Giants and the Redskins in the East, and the Packers and the Bears in the West. Basically, they owned the championships. They were always winning, so we've got this, you know, top dog guys up here sitting on the crown, and we've got the rest of them here just trying to gravel at their feet. But then that's not what they wanted. That's not true competition. That's not what gets the fans wondering if that's any given Sunday. So as part of the proposal, the deal was this. It's the draft as you see it today. The worst team gets to pick first in every round and the best team picks last. President Joe Carr and all the owners agreed it was a unanimous vote. Yes for competition. Yes for the last guys getting a little bit of a shot. Even though we still want to win. That is the Giants and the Redskins over there in the East and the Packers and the Bears over in the West. However, Bell and the owners did come out of this with five key points for the draft process. 
which was going to start after the 1935 season. The first point, basically this is just like we talked about. You got the inverse order of where they ended up. Not this snake draft fantasy football stuff we have nowadays, which I do feel is a little bit more fair, and I think they should consider that in the NFL. However, that's not how it is. You're the first one to pick in the first round. You're the first one to pick in the second round, and so on and so forth. The second point was that any first-year player not chosen or not on this list, well, you're free to sign anywhere, Bob, which this can kind of make you think about how in the NFLPA episodes, the players just wanted to abolish the NFL draft, which would make them free agents right out of college. I included links to the four-part series of the NFLPA in the show notes, which, by the way, you can get to the show notes through your podcast player of choice or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, I ask that you subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest off the press episodes each and every week. But now back to that third point of the five that they had. This one described that if a player was selected, they had valid reasons for playing in a city or not being able to play in that city for matters. Then there were stipulations in place where they could try to work around it. There's trades, selling contracts or other things i'm sure and either which way let's just say things might happen but it might not turn out too good for you we learned about that in the nflpa episode the fourth point was that if there is a controversy between any player and a club then it's going to the top the president joe carr himself he's gonna have the final word he's gonna drop that gravel down he's gonna say son this is my way or the highway you got two options And the other one, I don't think you're going to like. The fifth point is, if a player is selected by a club and he refuses to sign, then, you know, we're going to do this whole put you on a reserve list and you're going to be stuck with that club regardless. So if you ever do come back in the league and you want to play, well, you're playing for that club unless they trade your rights away to another team. So here we have our five points. The owners are sitting there high and mighty thinking, we got this thing figured out. You know, we're good to go. We like what we're going to do here. And there's a quote that comes from George Hallis on the proposal. He said, I thought the proposal was sound. It made sense. Tim Mara also approved. He and I had more to lose than any other team. With our support, the proposal was adopted. And here's what Tim Mara had to say about it. People come to see competition. We could give them competition only if the teams had some sort of equality. If the teams went up and down for the fortunes of life. Of course, that meant that our team would in the future win a championship every third year and people would start saying, what's happened to the Giants? They are not the team they used to be. That was a hazard we had to accept for the benefit of the league, of professional football, and for everyone. But enough of this whole sharpening of the axe and talking about things. Let's chop some wood. Let's get back to February 8th, 1936. This is the day of the first draft. It would live in infamy for NFL players forever because they just wanted freedom. But at the same time, this is giving you the opportunity. You may not see it yet, but this is going to give you the opportunity as a player for the league to grow leaps and bounds. But we got to get to that first draft. According to the league minutes, the owners called it the selection of players and the press called it selection of college prospects. Of course, later the next year, 1937, The league would call it the draft in the league minutes. Uh, Side note here, though, the word the draft during World War II, that wasn't really a very popular term. So they decided for a few years to not call it the draft anymore. But in this first draft, there were only nine teams. The Philadelphia Eagles picked first with a record of two and nine. Like I said, always bottom feed and always from the bottom of the barrel. Then it was the Boston Redskins, followed by the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Brooklyn Dodgers, the Chicago Cardinals, the Chicago Bears, the Green Bay Packers, the Detroit Lions, and to round it out, the New York Giants. They would select last. So like I said, Tim Mara, well, he's got a lot to lose here. The Lions, though, it's interesting because they were the champions the previous year. But it went by record, regardless of if you're the champion or not. But here it is. Go time. We've got these nine teams. We've got these owners here. We're sitting at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. We're just chilling probably with our cigars. We've got some beverages of choice and we're just sitting around a little room. But we got to figure out what who we're going to pick. So they took 90 names. They tossed it on the blackboard. Unknown for sure exactly where the names came from. But some say that, you know, they took few of the college football magazines, scrounged them up and 
One of them was given as a street and Smith. They took all these players, especially the the ones from the current All Americans. Let's throw them on the board and let's just start picking players. So just think about that though. They were less advanced professional football owners and all these kinds of things than even your modern day regular Joe Blow fantasy football player. They didn't really have scouting departments at the time, so they were just kind of taking players and scratching them off the list, just like a casual fantasy football player that doesn't study a whole lot. But even they have a lot more information than they did back then because they got the analysts that put them in order, at least some kind of cockamamie order where they're going to have a hope and a prayer and a shot to be able to pick the right players in the right order. But speaking of that, I got a little confession to make to you. People around my parts, they know this story, but I gotta say, I was a shyster at one of my fantasy football drafts back in the day. You see, we're going into the draft room. The morning of, we got this guy, not one to study or pay a whole lot of attention, and let's just say we're gonna leave him nameless. But we get there, and he talks about, well, I don't know who I'm gonna pick, I don't got a book. So yours truly, digs into his little satchel he's got, you know, probably a book bag, whatever it was. He takes out the previous year's fantasy football guy says, uh, here you go, use this one, bro. Sure enough, he did. And let's just say that probably didn't work out to him for a while because, as we all know, fantasy football rankings change from year to year. However, it could have backfired on yours truly because, as we know as well, the rankings don't necessarily dictate the outcomes of the end of the year. So, try that next year in your fantasy football draft, but don't tell him I said so. But the one guy that was in the room that kind of knew what he was talking about, kind of thinks about your truly, you know, uh, someone who studies a little bit and kind of has a little bit idea what's going on. The article said that Wellington Mera, you know, the son of Tim Mera, he was someone who kind of at least had some kind of scouting, understanding of how the prospects were going to be. So he would end up having a pretty decent career when it comes to that. And originally, the president, Joe Carr, he announced that each team was going to select five dudes. The owners agreed, though, let's make that nine rounds, baby. Let's take nine teams. Let's make it nine rounds for 81 of those 90 names are going to be selected off the board. But now we're at the draft. We're at nine rounds. Let's light this firecracker and let that sucker fly. First pick, first ever NFL draft pick. Well, let's just say there was a blue chipper kind of can't miss dude sitting there at number one. His name was Jay Berwinger. Here's some of his feats to kind of give you an idea. Well, he was a University of Chicago's halfback, but he did it all. I mean, he was, well, back in the 30s, they all did it all. It was offense, defense, punter, kicker, get the guy a water, whatever it was. He was also the recipient of the first ever Downtown Athletic Club trophy. If you don't know what that means, let's just put it this way. He was the first ever winner of the Heisman Memorial Trophy. So the first Heisman. And a man of many nicknames was he. He was the genius of the gridiron. The one-man team, the flying Dutchman, the man in the iron mask. That last one was given because he wore a special mask to protect his nose that he broke two different times. He was the captain of the team. He was the captain of the track team. He was the senior class president in college, and he was the head of his fraternity, Psy Upsilon. And to top it off, he was the only Heisman recipient that was ever tackled by a future president of the United States. Gerald Ford, that future president, he recalled a game against Behringer from the 1934 season. He said, When I tackled Jay in the second quarter, I ended up with a bloody cut, and I still have the scar to prove it. So with this background, this is like I said, a surefire can't miss number one overall player. Just packed the bags and sent him off. So of course, Eagles had the first pick. They took Jay Behringer, and they gave him the honor of being the first ever NFL draft pick The first draft pick ever in 1936. But that guy over in Chicago, George Hallis, man, he had the itch. He's like, you know what? Jay played college ball in my backyard. And I am George Hallis. And I have got to have this guy on my team. So what did he do? He offered veteran tackle Art Buss for Behringer. Behringer was asking for some ridiculous amount of money. He wanted $1,000 a game, which most guys at the time were only making like 50 bucks, so that's a steep price to pay. But Hallis, he still got the rights to this guy. And also, the draft would produce four future Hall of Famers. Hallis drafted two of them, but Behringer was not one of the guys. The first one that Hallis drafted was in the first round. 
he got Joe Steider, a tackle from West Virginia, and the other he got in the ninth round, Mr. Dan Fortman, who was a guard from Coldgate. Oh, darn, you know, I drafted two Hall of Fame linemen in the first ever draft, and look at me, I was complaining about the draft and not being the top guy anymore. But the Redskins, they also had a Hall of Famer. They drafted Wayne Milner in the eighth round. And the last Hall of Famer, Alfonso Tuffy Lehmans, was drafted by the Giants. So those four Hall of Famers, they were on three of the four teams we talked about that were always at the top. And another guy that was drafted, probably the most famous guy that got drafted in this first NFL draft ever, was a star from Alabama. His name, you may recall, his name was Paul Bear Bryant, and he was drafted number 31 overall by the Brooklyn Dodgers. But he never played, which was a recurring theme for many of these players back then. But even though he didn't play, he had arguably the greatest impact, maybe greater impact than all of these other players combined on this list for the game of football. And to understand the state of professional football at the time, only 24 of the 81 players that were drafted actually signed in 1936. Not like nowadays. I mean, you got players breaking down the doors just to get a chance to even be drafted, let alone being drafted. And well, you mean you got the holdouts and things like that, but hey, they're not going to not play in the NFL if they get drafted. And the first Mr. Irrelevant was Phil Flanagan out of Holy Cross. He was drafted by the Giants as well. But <laughs> like many of his other brethren, he did not play in the NFL ever. Never had to snap. And even though many didn't sign, this was still considered a smashing success. Think about it nowadays. I mean, you've got the NFL draft tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern. And how many people around the country, nay, probably around the world, are going to tune in to multiple TV outlets and they're going to be at Nashville watching this? Really, what is it? People getting selected, sitting down at their houses, sitting down in the green room and finally getting picked and going up on stage. But this would turn into what is now created the ultimate competitive league. But with that being said, although this inaugural NFL draft in 1936 was a smashing success and transformed the landscape of the offseason for NFL teams forever, it was not without its controversy. For you see, Jay Berringer, the first overall draft pick, after having his race traded to Chicago, said this, I haven't made my mind up yet. I haven't signed with the Bears, but I believe the decision in Philadelphia means the Chicago club has an option on my services if I decide to play pro football. And as crazy as it seems, the first overall drafted player in the NFL draft, and that's not just one year, I'm talking the whole kick caboodle shibbling thing, everything, the entire NFL draft from beginning to the end, never stepped foot on a professional Gridiron. So, the first NFL draft was an important moment in professional sports history. That's a non negotiable statement. This week, we have a favorite football moment from Brandon, the co host of the Florida Focus podcast, and it revolves around college football, which ties in pretty nice to this week's episode for college players being drafted into the NFL. And here we go. Take it away, Brandon. Hey, Arnie. Football History Dude, this is Brandon. I'm co-host of Florida Focus, a college football podcast. You can find our show at floridafocuspodcast.com. As I sat on the bed in the medical exam room, paper crunching beneath me, staring at the medical wall of the brochures, all I was hoping for was a written excuse for school. You see, several days before, as a freshman at Florida State University in Tallahassee, I attended the Florida State versus Miami game in 2005. The Florida State Seminoles were battling their arch rival, the Miami Hurricanes, and they lost five straight games. The Seminoles would march out on the field with a freshman quarterback with 83,000 screaming fans wearing their favorite garnet and gold colors. And the rivalry between these schools was never without drama. Multiple times, my Florida State Seminoles losing by three or less points. Florida State is in a tight game. They're leading 10-7 to with two minutes left. The Miami Hurricanes, the arch rival, has driven down the field, and they're attempting a field goal attempt, which, of course, is worth three points and would have tied the game. I'm thinking to myself, as my eyes could barely peek through my fingers, I can't imagine Florida State, my team, having to drive down the field one more time to try and get a score. Imagine in Rocky 1, not 5, 2, or 3, the really bad ones, but in Rocky 1, if Balboa had to go a 16th round with Apollo Creed. I couldn't stomach the thought. 
So as I watched the attempt go, I realized with great joy that Miami had botched the kick. Miami wasn't able to kick it because it was a bad snap. They scrambled around to try to throw the ball in the end zone, and it fell incomplete. Florida State was able to hang on for the first time in six tries. They defeated their arch rival, the Miami Hurricanes. The crowd was going crazy. I was yelling so hard, I even blacked out for a few seconds. I go home, and once the dust settles that night, I wake up the next morning with this incredible itchy bruise on my back. You see, as the nurse practitioner before me in the exam room looked at my blistery skin that crawled around a left rib, she immediately knew I had shingles. An extremely rare condition for a 20-year-old, and mostly brought on by extreme stressful situations. So you see, Arnie, my favorite football memory is not in the NFL at all, although many players from that game went on to play in the NFL. But rather, my favorite football memory is from the college game, the 2005 Florida State Seminoles versus the Miami Hurricanes. I did end up getting a note to excuse myself from classes, and I was able to show people how much football meant to me because I had a permanent battle scar. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about how Burt Bell used the first NFL draft to change the landscape of professional sports forever. If you enjoyed the show, I ask that you subscribe for free by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the freshest, hottest out the press episodes each and every week. Now in the upcoming episode, we get to take a look at another major turning point in the growth of the sport, the first televised draft in NFL history. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.